title of this video is No New Heart. No way, no new heart. And I'm going to be voicing over a so-called documentary to recall this quote amazing historic event. Now notice he's beginning at the sea. In the other video I did on this that refers to the sea of forgetfulness. Forget reality, forget logic, and just come on into the story, walk with him calmly along the shores. I'm standing at the very southern tip of Africa. Behind me is magnificent Table Mountain, one of Africa's most famous landmarks. For centuries, this sandstone mountain has welcomed seafarers and adventurers who rounded the Cape of Good Hope and set out to explore the vast interior that lies behind its massive flat top summit. And 50 years ago, one of them, a son of Africa, performed a medical miracle right here in the shadow of Table Mountain. Not. That stunned the medical fraternity and changed the lives of thousands of people around the world. With hopes. I'm in Cape Town following the footsteps of Dr. Christian Barna. Stay with us to hear his inspiring story. It may just give you a change of heart story. and bring you peace and happiness. Sure, you have peace and happiness by listening to nonsense. No new heart. Notice the globe. Africa is the second largest of the Earth's... Why do they always show a globe? Because that's the major deception that all of us have been put under. That we live on a circular sphere orbiting around the sun. That's the major deception. Another reason they always show you a globe is uh, because it's symbolic of Baal or Baal or the or the Baal of Baal or the Baals of Baal, the false god, which is another name for the devil. And notice how always the so-called views of Earth are always different. They're <laughs> never quite the same. I think there's actually some subliminals in this. Uh, if you look carefully at it, I think there's subliminals in this as well. And it's a continent of superlatives when it comes to natural wonders. The world's longest river, the world's largest desert, the world's largest waterfall, the fastest animal on earth, the tallest animal in the world, the largest land animal, and on and on we could go. Africa has it all. And the tallest tail. <laughs> You're about to be told a tale. But even with all this natural wealth and beauty, it's the people that live here that make Africa special. Africans have made significant contributions to the fields of language, writing, architecture, mathematics, and religion. The same can be said for other fields as well. They've led the way in establishing law codes, the mining of minerals, iron smelting, international trade, philosophy, and medicine. And it was in this field, medicine, that an extraordinary event took place 50 years ago in Cape Town that stunned the world's medical fraternity. A young South African doctor performed a medical miracle. Dr. Christian Barnard performed the world's first human-to-human -human heart transplant here at Fruitaskir Hospital. And by doing so, he pushed the boundaries of science into the dawn of a new medical era that has brought life and hope to thousands of people around the world. Okay, a lot of times these hoaxes are done somewhere far off. So you would think something like, why wasn't there one done in the United States? Or why wasn't there one done in Europe? 
Why Cape Town, South Africa? Well, because it's hard to investigate, especially in the year 1967. That's the claim, that it was done in December of 1967. So who's going to go all the way to Cape Town, South Africa to investigate? You just believe it. It comes on the news. And you believe it, even though it's a lie. Christian Mietling Barnard was born on the 8th of November 1922 in the sleepy little town of Beaufort West in the western province of South Africa. It's famous for its donkey carts and they're still one of the most interesting ways to tour the town today. Beaufort West was the first town established in South Africa's arid interior region called the Great Karoo and it's known as the capital of the Karoo. Near the old town hall in the centre of Beaufort West is the Barnard family home, where young Chris grew up with his four brothers. His father, Adam Barnard, was the minister of the local Dutch Reformed Church, and the family lived in the old church parsonage next door to the church. One of his brothers, Abraham, died of a heart problem at the age of five, and this tragedy made a lasting impression on young Chris. His early years were closely linked to the old Dutch Reform Mission Church where his father preached and his mother played the organ. His parents were compassionate people who ministered to the poor. Their values and work ethic were passed on to Chris and his brothers. The boys were encouraged to do their best and pursue excellence in all they did. Young Chris developed a strong inner drive and was methodical and purposeful in all his endeavours. Okay, it sort of looks like that's been photoshopped. It kind of looks like this face here is different than the other ones, like it's been photoshopped in or created in a studio. He's an actor. I haven't identified him, but I know, I know he's an actor. He also inherited his parents' compassion for poor and oppressed people of all races and nationalities. And this remained a character trait throughout his life. Chris attended Beaufort West Central High School. He was a good student and applied himself to his studies. He did well at school. Notice her donkeys. <laughs> What's the implication if you're listening to this? And in addition to excelling in his schoolwork, he also learned music and played sport. Chris matriculated from Beaufort West Central High School with high grades in 1940 and decided to further his studies at university. He decided to study medicine and so moved to Cape Town and enrolled in the University of Cape Town Medical School. The Barnard family wasn't wealthy, but he managed to secure a scholarship he stayed with his older brother and walked to the university. There was little money to spare and they were challenging years. But Barnard applied himself to his studies and graduated from the University of Cape Town in 1945. He completed his internship and residency at Hruteskir Hospital, situated on the slopes of Devil's Peak in the shadow of Table Mountain. Kruteskir is the chief academic hospital of the University of Cape Town's medical school and provides tertiary care and instruction in all the major branches of medicine. Barnard then left Cape Town and worked as a general practitioner in Ceres, a rural town in the Cape province. In 1951, Barnard returned to Cape Town where he worked in the Department of Medicine Notice the G in the background. He completed his master's degree the and the doctorate in medicine symbol in 1953 G. from the University of Cape Town. In 1956, he received a two-year scholarship for postgraduate training in cardiothoracic surgery at the University of Minnesota Medical School in Minneapolis, United States. When he returned to South Africa in 1958, Barnard was appointed cardiothoracic surgeon 
at the Krutuskia Hospital and established the hospital's first heart unit. He introduced open heart surgery to his home country and designed artificial valves for the human heart. He also experimented with the transplantation of the hearts of dogs. More than 50 dogs. Okay, remember, dog spelled backward is God. So they're playing God, playing the role of God. How can anyone give life to another? That's science fiction, like Frankenstein. I understand Mary Shelley never told exactly how Frankenstein came alive. And if you've watched the old movies, they show like an electrical storm, an electrical bolt, lightning, uh, bringing Frankenstein to life. But I think in the original version, she never explains. So there you are. There's dog. God spelled backwards. They're playing God. Receive transplanted hearts. For several years, Barnard continued experimenting with animal heart transplants. With this experience, and with the availability of new breakthroughs introduced by several other heart surgery pioneers, Barnard was finally in a position to prepare for a human transplant. And he had a patient willing to undergo the procedure. Louis Wyszkanski was a 53-year-old grocer suffering from diabetes and incurable heart disease. His heart was grossly enlarged and was going to fail at any moment. There was no hope for him. Without a new heart, his days were numbered. So Chris Barnard and his team had a desperate and willing patient in need of a heart transplant. But they needed a suitable donor. Now, Chris Barnard and his team weren't the only surgical team preparing to conduct a human heart transplant. At least three American heart surgeons and their teams were also ready and waiting to perform a human heart transplant. By the end of 1967, the research and preparation was complete. The time had come to perform that once unthinkable act, the transplant of a human heart from one person to another. And because it was all about the heart, that legendary seat of emotion, which the public and media persisted in romanticizing, there was an intense desire among the cardiac surgeons to be at the cutting edge of history, to perform the world's first human heart transplant. Cutting edge of history, a little pun there. So the race was on to be the first to perform the ultimate operation an operation that depended on the right mix of skill, character, and circumstance. The drama of the world's first human heart transplant was played out here within the walls of Charleston Theatre at Schroederskir Hospital on the 3rd of December, 1967. Notice he said the drama. That's all it is. And this is a wax museum of nonsense. Theatres A and B are the original surgery theatres used for the first human heart transplant. Notice he said surgery theatres. <laughs> Just like the word theatre is used in war, the Pacific Theatre of War, the European Theatre of War, it's the same idea. It's just nonsense dramatized in a play, a Masonic play. The in them is laid out just as it was when the pioneering operation took place here 50 years ago. The first human heart transplant was one of the greatest moments in medical history and was made possible by an extraordinary interplay of scientific dedication, human courage and generosity and a timely chain of events. And magic, occult powers. Saturday, the 2nd of December, 1967, was a fresh summer's day in Cape Town. The locals were out in force, enjoying the pre-Christmas bustle. Among them was 25-year-old Denise Deval. She and her family were enjoying a shopping day together, plus five preparing for Christmas and the festive season. They were oblivious of the tragedy about to unfold 
that would claim Denise's life and set in motion a chain of events that would change the face of open heart surgery forever. On that fateful day, Denise de Waal and her mother stopped here on Main Road, Salt River, to buy a cream cake for their afternoon tea. As they were crossing the road right here, they were struck by a drunk driver. Both Denise and her mother were fatally injured. Shortly after the accident, which took place just a kilometre from Kruitskir Hospital, Anne oh, to be near the hospital. drove past the accident scene on her way back from visiting her dying husband in the hospital. She was a sensitive woman and averted her gaze from the scene of the fatal accident. Little did she realize that within 12 X hours, one of the broken bodies lying in the room would give her husband a heart and another chance at life. Denise Duval was a gentle and giving young woman. Her tragic and unexpected death brought great sorrow to her family, but they showed great courage and compassion in donating her heart to save the life of another person. Her heart will become... Okay, you might be wondering why did they fake a human heart transplant? Well, it was to get people to, quote, start donating organs. So that is an industry and brings a great deal of profit Plus, there can be used some mysterious occult usage in the donation of organs. I'm not saying that other organ transplants uh, are fake, such as kidney transplant. However, I am zeroing in only on this one, the human heart. Why? Because it's the essence of life. It keeps beating. And that's life. So who is the only one that's the giver of life? God Almighty. Not fake science. And that's the whole idea. You take so-called science and it pushes aside the Holy Word of God. You take fake science and now in a sense Mankind, humankind, womankind becomes God. That's why it was faked. But there was an incredible amount of profit made on uh, organ donation after this because this will kick off the whole idea of organ donation. Heart selflessly donated to save another person's life, and a heart which subsequently played a vital role in the advancement of medical knowledge. After being declared brain dead, Denise Duval was brought here to Theatre B, the donor theatre, short... Uh, that's another issue in this whole development of, quote, heart transplant. Uh, at this particular time, the actual definition of death is related to the heart. Well, later it will shift to the brain. So then it becomes extremely strange that you might say somebody's heart is still pumping blood, but their brain is dead, so therefore they're dead. Well, that's not really true. If a person's still pumping blood, they're still alive. But that allowed them to have license to do a lot of other things later when you begin to talk about people being brain dead, but not heart dead. So there'll be a shift in the definition of death itself because of this. Midnight. She was prepared for surgery by Dr. Marius Barnard and his team. At 3 a.m. in Theatre A, the operation lasted four and three quarter hours and involved a team of there 30 surgeons, anaesthetists, <laughs> nurses and technicians. At precisely 6.13 a.m., her heart was carefully sewn into place in recipient Louis Wyshkansky's chest by Dr. Chris Barnard. So, 
the whole idea is say somebody is actually dead, physically dead. They remove the heart and it's just a hunk of flesh. It does not have life in it. And somehow they remove the heart of the other individual <laughs> and then they put in this hunk of flesh. Well, let's go on with the story. You can see the big gap. Somehow life just magically appears. Louis Wyszkanski's new heart began to beat strongly and Dr. Chris Barnard turned to his team and said, it's going to work. And work it did. Wyszkanski survived the operation. His new heart functioned normally for 18 days. However, he succumbed to pneumonia as he was taking immunosuppressive 18, drugs. That's nine. The drugs ensured that Wyszkanski's body didn't reject the new heart but sadly weakened his immune system and he had no defense against infection. Though the first patient with the heart of another human being survived only a little more than two weeks, Barnard had passed a milestone in a new field of life extending surgery. This first transplant was and remains the most publicized event in world medical history. Publicized. Event. Chris Barnard became a household Not name. Reality. He was celebrated around the world for his accomplishment. Monarchs, presidents, and prime ministers honored him. Sure, everybody he was photogenic and enjoyed the media attention following the operations. Dr. Chris Barnard continued to perform heart transplants. Another transplant operation was conducted less than a month later on the 2nd of January 1968. And the patient, Philip Lyberg, survived for 570 days or 19 months. And then Dirk van Seyl, who received a new heart by Chris Barnard in 1971, was the longest lived heart transplant patient, surviving over 23 years. Throughout his life, Chris Barnard championed the cause of the poor and the oppressed. He exhibited an amazing blend of vision, intelligence and kindness tempered by human frailties. But despite these frailties, he made the world a better place, particularly for those who need a new heart. And that's what he'll always be remembered for. The good doctor who could give people hope. The one who could pull patients back from the brink of death. Who could give them new hearts. That symbol of love and life you're hearing about all the sort of attributes of God and how now they're embodied in this individual, Dr. Christian Barnard. Somehow he can give hope, somehow he can give life. He's concerned and compassionate for the poor. Everything that the Bible seems to say about God, they just transferred to this one individual. Would give them their lives. There's the devil's horns right there. Take a look at it. Take a look at it. There's your devil's horns. And in a sense, that's what we all need. Now, I know it may seem hard to believe, but that's the reality. Hard to believe. That's right, it's hard to believe because it's nonsense. That's the reality. No way. That's the real R-E-E-L, not R-E-A-L. Sorry, Mr. Kent, it's nonsense. When we find out the true condition and nature of our hearts, we discover we all need a new heart, all of us, including you and me. When the Bible talks about the human heart, it refers to the center of a person's being, involving the mind, the emotions, the reason, the will, the life, the whole being, who we really are. And the Bible has a lot to say about the condition and nature of our hearts. That's right, it's Notice evil. What it says in and Genesis you're seeing chapter evil six, coming at you now. Verse five. The Lord saw that the wickedness of <laughs> there man you go. was great in the earth. And that every intention of the well, thoughts of his heart was evil continually. 
Because the evil is right in front of you. The lies. That somehow, human beings gave life to another human being. Nonsense. Lies. Only God gives life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, is what it says in Job. And so, if there's life to be bestowed, it's bestowed by God. It doesn't come when somebody takes a hunk of flesh, puts it in somebody's chest cavity, and puts an electrical current in it. No way. You've just sort of seen the first real sci-fi book, Frankenstein, by Mary Shelley, replayed in front of your eyes. Except we didn't call it Frankenstein, did we? We called it a heart transplant. Well, I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and I'd like to draw you and your heart to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the truth is in His Holy Word, the Bible. Thank you for watching.